Okay. Um, happy Hanukkah, everyone. Thank you for those of you that are live that are able to join us. Special shout out to my dear friends in Chicago who uh, made a point of joining us for a uh, video conferencing session. We like to have Torah study going on uh, even after our Israel trip. And so what I want to discuss today is the meaning of Hanukkah. Because if you take a look around the Jewish world, so much of the Jewish world celebrates Hanukkah and it has so much meaning for people and it's all, uh, all about gifts and light and joy and uh, public menorah lightings and it's all great. The worst thing that could happen to us on Hanukkah though, uh, I would argue is for us to go through this holiday and not change in the process. That is the beauty in Jewish holidays is that they are each an opportunity not only for us to connect to each other and to connect to God, but also to dig deep into ourselves and try to tap into the energy that exists in that holiday. And so the same way Rosh Hashanah is Judgment Day and the same way Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement and the same way uh, Passover is the holiday of freedom. So in the rabbinical holidays of Purim and Hanukkah as well, there is a mission. And on Hanukkah, I, we have a very, very big mission. What's super, super interesting is that Hanukkah is probably one of the most celebrated holidays in Judaism, and yet, unfortunately, so many in our people are so distant from uh, community, from synagogue, from, mm -hmm. from tradition, whatever you want to call it, and Hanukkah itself is a celebration of that. Okay? Take a look behind me. You see the Hanukkah candles. The uniqueness of fire is that it has both physical and spiritual qualities. Um, you, can, you can't really hold it, you can't touch it, but if you put your finger there, it's going to hurt, <laughs> obviously. And it also has this special property where unlike everything else which comes down based on gravity, fire goes against gravity and is always climbing higher. So the truth is, is that we're looking at the fire of Hanukkah, at the light of Hanukkah, reminding us what the Maccabees actually fought for. This was a lot more than just nationalistic freedom fighting, even though that was definitely the case as well. This was fighting for our heritage. That's really what it was. We're going to see in this class that the Greeks tried uh, stripping us of our Judaism. And what we accomplished in the miracle of Hanukkah, was taking our Judaism back. That's what it was all about. And so the lights and the candles and the Hanukkah and everything, it's beautiful, but it's so important at least once in these eight days to actually focus on the reason why the rabbis felt the need to make this into a holiday. This is not the only holiday Sorry, the war that the story of Hanukkah commemorates is not the only war that the Jewish people had a victory over their enemies. There are many instances throughout history where the Jewish people were able to overcome uh, their, uh, their enemies. And so why is it, that's going to be one of our questions, uh, why is it that Hanukkah and the story of the Jews defeating the Greeks, why is that more of a reason, why was that more of a reason for the rabbis to institute a holiday around it versus other, uh, versus other uh, military victories. So again, to start off the introduction, it's Hanukkah, it's a Jewish holiday. The Jewish holidays are there for us to grow from them, uh, provided we tap into the meaning that lies within. And so the goal of the class today is gonna be to really investigate what was unique about the story and how does it apply to us on a personal level that would enable us to, uh, to come out greater people? That's really the objective. Okay? So we're going to start with four, qu four questions. Question number one. Okay? And that is a question that we just asked just now before is, why is the military victory of the Jews over the Greeks unique in the sense that it was specifically in that war that the rabbis decided to institute a holiday. I'm going to call it a rabbinic holiday because you're not going to find Hanukkah mentioned in the written law. If you open up the Torah, you're not going to find Hanukkah mentioned there because the rabbis were the ones who instituted the holiday of Hanukkah 
after the miraculous victory of the Jews over the Greeks. So question number one is, what's unique about that whole episode that warranted it uh, earning its own uh, holiday? That's question number one. Question number two is, the Talmud actually does mention Hanukkah, and the Talmud asks, what is Hanukkah? What is Hanukkah all about? And Rashi explains that the Gemara is really asking, for which miracle was the holiday of Hanukkah established? After all, we know that there are really two miracles about Hanukkah. There is the military victory where very, very few defeated very, very many. The Maccabees, the Jews, defeated the Greeks. And the second miracle we know is that after the battle, after the war was done, the Jews came into the temple after the Greeks were driven out and they came and they only found one jug of oil, of pure olive oil, that really only had enough oil for one day. And in the end, when they lit the menorah in the temple, it miraculously ended up uh, lasting eight complete days. And when the Talmud asks, what's the miracle of Hanukkah? The Talmud only mentions the uh, light and the oil lasting for eight days. So the question that we have is, what, why only in Hanukkah did we as a people deserve this miracle of light? What's unique? What's unique about the miracle of Hanukkah and the whole story with the Greeks that warranted this miracle of light? That's question number two. Question number three is that the Gemara, the Talmud, doesn't seem to mention the uh, military victory. The Gemara only mentions the miracle of the oil. Why doesn't the Gemara mention the miracle of the Jews defeating the Greeks. That's question number three. And question number four is, is that if you open up the Sidur, okay, you'll notice in the Shemona Esrei that there is a specific part called Al Hanisim where we mention the holiday of Hanukkah. We also have a special part where we mention the holiday of Purim. But if you take a look at that part of the Sidur, that one only mentions the miracle of the military victory. What happened to the miracle of the oil? So again, why in the Talmud does it only mention the miracle of the oil? Why in the Sidur, in that special portion of the Sidur where we talk about Hanukkah, why does that only mention the military victory and not the miracle of the oil? So those are the four questions that I wanted to start the, cl the class off. And then we're going to go through three separate uh, ideas and topics that will hopefully answer these questions. So concept number one, we're going to want to know who were these Greeks? That's question number one. <laughs> Question number two is, what kinds of miracles exist in this world? Because if we can categorize different types of miracles, maybe we can understand why there's a difference between a military victory miracle versus a miracle of supernatural proportions like the oil lasting for eight days. And lastly, what is required of the human being to overcome his basic human nature? So those are the three concepts we're going to discuss briefly to try to help explain the above four questions, okay? So point number one, who are the Greeks? Who, who were the Greeks? So it's important to remember that the, the Greeks were, to date, back then, the most modern nation that had ever lived, and their ideology was one of placing supreme importance on the physical on the physique, on nature. Everything natural was divine in the eyes of the Greeks. That's why you find, even if, if any of you have ever been to Greece, you see a lot of their statues are basically naked human beings. What's with the naked human being statues, right? Put some clothes on, right? And so the idea is, is that they idolized and cherished the idea of human perfection and nature and natural perfection, okay? The concept of survival of the fittest was originally a Greek concept, right? Any baby that was born with a defect was left to die. They would slam the baby into, uh, into a wall and they would uh, throw them to the sea. The athletes in Greek culture were the priests, the gymnasium was the temple, and, uh, and they worshipped nature essentially. Now, while the Greeks did go through an entire uh, crusade of conquering the world, there was this one nation that stood out as going directly opposed to their ideology, an ideology of attributing greatness and power and divineness okay, to the human body. 
And that was the Jewish people. The Jewish people had spent centuries or thousands of years fighting these kinds of ideas, fighting the notion that anything other than a, an all-powerful God could be the reason for the creation of the world, and striving for spirituality. Spirituality was not involved in the, in the Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy spoke about nature, spoke all about the, the beauty of the human body and the beauty of nature. And so that's why when they came across Israel and they see a nation that is serving a, a, a god and attributing the world to that god, they realize there's, there's something here. We have to make sure this nation is shut down. They are directly opposing the empire. The empire places greatest importance on, on nature and physicality. And so you'll see that the text teaches us, the rabbis teach us, that there were three specific Jewish mitzvahs that were forbidden uh, in the times of Hanukkah, in the times of that war, which prompted the Hasmoneans, which prom prompted the Maccabees to fight with the Greeks. Because the Jewish people, ultimately, without the Torah, we are left with very, very little. If we are not given the ability to, uh, to um, practice our Judaism in the most authentic way, then we are like fish out of water. The Torah is compared to water. A fish out of water, it's a matter of time before the fish is gone. We, the Jewish people, what has arguably kept us alive and going uh, all these years is the Torah. And so when the Maccabees realize that the Greeks are taking away our chance to live as Jews, we have to fight. Otherwise, we're, we're done. So what are the three mitzvahs that were prohibited uh, in the times of Hanukkah? There were three. Number one, Shabbat. There was no keeping Shabbat uh, in the Greek uh, decrees. You weren't allowed to keep Shabbat. Number two, no Brit Milah. You're not allowed to do the circumcision. And number three, Kiddush HaChodesh, you're not allowed to sanctify the new moon. This begs the question, is the Greeks could have prohibited many different types of mitzvahs. They could have prohibited holidays. They could have prohibited kosher. They could have prohibited, uh, you know, any one of the 613 mitzvahs. So why did the Greeks single out Shabbat, Brit Milah, and Kiddush HaChodesh? What, were, what was unique about those three? So if you think about it, based on the definition we gave of who the Greeks represented, who they were, it's very understandable why those three were singled out. Each of those three represented something that went directly opposed to their ideology. Think about it. What is Brit Milah, for example? Essentially, Brit Milah is you are mutilating a human body in their eyes. How could you take a pure, perfect human being, they haven't even begun living, and you are cutting off a piece of that human being? That is the worst thing you could do in Greek ideology. You're taking a perfect piece of physicality, something that we believe is divine, and you are, and you are mutilating it. So they were against Brit Milah. What about Shabbat? So the Jewish observance of Shabbat is an affirmation of our belief in Hashem. Why? Because Hashem created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh day. When we keep Shabbat, we are being like God. We are affirming our belief in God. We are attributing the world to God. The same way God created the world in six days and then rested, we are working in our own lives for six days and then we rest on the seventh day. But according to Greek ideology, how could you be keeping Shabbat as an affirmation of your belief in your God? What God? We, the Greeks, don't believe in a God. We, the Greeks, believe in nature. We believe in the human body. Your keeping of Shabbat goes directly opposed to our ideology. And so Shabbat, out the door. Now, the next one is a little bit complicated, but I'll give you the background. Kiddush HaChodesh is sanctifying the new moon. The way it used to work in biblical times, or in Talmudic times, when the Jews had a dominion in Israel and they had a court system, the way that they would announce a new month, a new moon, would be that witnesses would have to perceive a new moon physically. They would have to see a new moon. They would come and testify in a Jewish court. We've seen the new moon. It is now halachically okay to announce the new month. Okay? 
and the uh, and that's when Rosh Chodesh would occur. That's when the first of the month would would be called based on the testimony of these witnesses. Now you can imagine for Greeks this is a very a uh, uh, ridiculous concept because according to Greek ideology, it is all scientifically uh, um, correlated. How could you attribute a scientific reality of when a month ought to start or when the moon ought to shift? How do you perceive that based on a godly principle of, t of, of witnesses witnessing the moon going to the courts and the courts declaring the month? That has nothing to do with nature, right? We today do not have the means of understanding how scientifically that reconciles itself, but it, but it does. But the Greeks, either way, were, were, were not having any of it. And so they forbade those three things, Brit Milah, Shabbat, and the sanctifying of the new moon. And so they made war against us. And this wasn't just any military war. It wasn't just a war of, uh, of conquest or of domination. This was a war of ideologies. This was the forces of natural versus the forces of supernatural. And never in the world had there been a war thus far that was pitting these two types of ideologies together. And that already starts giving you a, a hint of where we're going with this, of why the military victory was so unique that it deserved or it became a, a, a holiday in and of itself. So that is the idea of who the Greeks are. Now let's talk about what kinds of miracles there are in this world, okay? So one kind of a miracle is what's called a nace, okay? The word for miracle loosely translated is nace. There really is no word for miracle in Hebrew. The word nace literally means a banner, okay? Why is the word for miracle also the word for banner? Because that is what a miracle essentially is. A miracle is a banner of God essentially reminding us, hey, I'm here. I'm running the world. These kinds of things are able to happen because of me. You have to connect to me. Okay? Now, some miracles are out of the ordinary. Some miracles are woven into the fabric of nature. And it is our job to recognize those miracles when they occur. One of the famous questions of Hanukkah is, why do we light eight lights on Hanukkah? Why eight? Maybe we should only light seven. Why seven? Because when the Maccabees came into the temple, there was enough oil for one, one day. If there's enough oil for one day, then the first day that the oil lit should not really be considered miraculous because there was anyways enough oil for that one day. It was the extra seven days that was miraculous. You follow? And so maybe we should only be celebrating seven days of Hanukkah, not eight. So there's literally hundreds and hundreds of answers to this question. This is one of the most famous questions that, is, uh, that exists in, uh, in Jewish text. I'll give, you, um, I'll give you two answers, and there are literally hundreds of answers to this question. But I'll give you two that I like. The answer that I like the most is the idea that even the fact that oil can burn is itself a miracle. I know that might not... Uh, resonate with, with some of us because we're so used to realities of life. Yeah, sure, a light can turn on. Yeah, sure, a, a car works. Sure, my human body is, be is beating blood through my, through my body. My heart is beating, whatever. We are so used to the miracles around us that we fail to remind ourselves about the miracle of nature in and of itself. And so even though there was definitely a supernatural miracle of the oil lasting an extra seven days, that doesn't mean that that first day of regular oil lighting is not itself something to be uh, appreciated, something to, to, uh, to analyze and something to uh, acknowledge. That itself is a miracle. There had to be a God to create the olives for us to be able to turn that into oil and then for that oil to be flammable, to be kindled. That itself is something special. Another idea to answer that question is that um, what they did was the Maccabees perhaps divided that one flask of oil into uh, eight parts, and therefore each eighth should not have been enough to last a day, but it did in fact last a day, in which case even day one was a miracle because they divided it into eight separate portions of one eighth of one day's worth of oil, which ended up lasting a full day each, each, each day. Okay, not to get carried away with that. So those are the two types of miracles, supernatural, natural. Now, let's go to the next stage of how 
do we overcome our human nature? Okay, so the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutato, who wrote the famous book, The Path of the Just, and the book, Derech Hashem, The Way of God, amongst many, many other famous books, he writes something extremely, extremely important that we always review in our study of Judaism, and that is that a human being is not homogenous. What that means is, is that if you take any item in the world and you were to divide it up in half, you cut it in half, and you look inside, you'll see the same item even though you cut the rock in half. It's the same rock on both sides. Inside the rock, it's all rock. It's all homogenous. Anything in life is that way, except for the human being. When it comes to the human being, we are really two beings that are woven into one structure. If you were to take a human being and separate the human being, what you're dealing with is two separate concepts. One is the goof, one is the body, and one is the neshama, one is the soul. And the two are forced into a coexistence. This was God's plan. God's intent was for us to be given the ability to earn our existence by making the soul the master of the body and not vice versa. So every time in life we have a decision to make, usually one of, one of the decisions is going to please ourselves physically, our goof, our bodies. Another decision is going to please our nishama. You coming tonight and learning Torah is an expression of wanting your nishama, of your nishama wanting to grow, wanting to learn. Okay? Now, the nishama, the soul, and the goof, the body, have different uh, volumes. When I say volumes, I mean sound. The neshama whispers. The neshama is like a piece of godliness within us that whispers in our hearts what we really ought to do, what we really want to do deep down. We want to do what's right. The problem is, is that our bodies scream. They don't whisper. I want the food now. I want to sleep now. I want to stay in my bed. I want to enjoy this physical experience. And very, very often, the neshama the soul gets drowned out in the noise so that we are often pulled towards our physicality and we are not able often to, uh, to follow where, where the soul wants us to go, right? So the, again, the goof, the body wants immediate gratification while the nishama, the piece of godliness within us, wants to connect to its source. And what is its source? Its source is God himself. And so there's a part within us that wants to connect to our creator, that wants to connect to the Almighty. Okay, now here's the main point here, is that the same battle that the Jews faced against the Greeks is the exact same battle that we ourselves face within ourselves. It's a similar battle of, of, of strong versus weak. The body is strong, the soul is weak. And what you'll notice is that the only way the neshama can possibly get its message across is through a miracle. The only way the Maccabees, the only way the Jews were able to defeat the Greeks was through a miracle. And so the microcosm of that and the way that makes itself applicable for us as individual Jews is that as soon as we acknowledge and realize that the same battle that occurred then is the same battle that we have individually throughout our lifetimes, the sooner we can realize that it takes a miracle for us to win. The same way it took a miracle for the Maccabees to beat the Greeks, it takes a miracle for us to beat the bodily desires that are looking to drown out the, the voice of our neshama. Now, I want to make a disclaimer because we, there's a, still a lot more to add to this. But one disclaimer is, is that we don't believe that, we, that the physical pleasures that exist in this world are not there for us to enjoy. We do believe in Judaism that we ought to enjoy uh, the, uh, the, the, the beauty in the world that, that we have. Um, for example, uh, uh, if I want to drink uh, uh, water, right? That's, that's an enjoyment. God only asks that we connect to him in the process of that enjoyment. How do I connect to God in the process of enjoying this water? I make a blessing. The Talmud says that until I make a blessing, the water is not really mine. It's almost as if I'm stealing it because what, who, who says I deserve this water, right? The blessing is a way of connecting to God and thanking him for the water that he made available to you. But that's just one example of how we can enjoy the physical beauty in this world while lifting 
the uh, action to the spiritual domain. Okay? The Cheshbon Nefesh, who's the name of an author, also writes, he discusses how we overcome bad habits in human nature. And he says like this, and this is so beautiful. He says that with every effort we make in life to overcome those bodily desires that take us further from the neshama or that take us further from God, what we're doing is we're slowly filling up a vial of oil with drops of oil, okay? Which eventually, once it's full, it's ready to explode into a beam of light that illuminates the darkness, right? There would be no hope for our bodies to have any chance to defeat the Yitzhar Hara, or I should say, there would be no hope for our nishamas, for our souls, to overcome our bodies if it wasn't for this miraculous power of our constant acts of goodness eventually leading to a miracle of overcoming that Yitzhar Hara, that evil inclination, that, that bodily power. Okay? So essentially what we're discussing here is that that you fight and you fight and you fight until you've reached a climax where you've earned a miracle without which you would not be able to overcome the mighty strength of that physicality. The same way the Greeks were fighting the Maccabees, they must have been laughing at the Jews. Like, what are these Jews thinking fighting us? We are the global power. Imagine a, a, a synagogue or imagine, I should say, a group of 20, 30 uh, 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 Jews uh, declaring war against the United States, declaring war against Russia, whatever it is. <clears throat> it wouldn't make any sense, right? So, so you can imagine that they're coming with all of their um, mightiest weapons and they're fighting us. And how are we fighting back? How are the Jews fighting back? They're fighting back with Shabbat. They're fighting back with Brit Milah. They're fighting back with Kiddush HaChodesh. The Greeks must have been laughing at us. But at the same time, the Jews, what's keeping them going? What were the Maccabees thinking, fighting the Greeks? They're thinking, we got to keep fighting. We have to keep fighting and filling up our vial of oil till the point where we reach a climax where we will miraculously be able to overcome this adversity and, and fight this darkness with the light that we've earned through the constant through the constant fighting. It says in the Torah, it says, Ki ner mitzvah v'torah or, that um, every mitzvah is itself a candle, and the Torah itself is light, which actually works out very well with the story of Hanukkah, because what are we doing on Hanukkah? We're lighting nerot, we're lighting a candle. But again, the message for us as individuals is, we ourselves are fighting this same, same battle, this similar battle within us every single day. And the same way we're lighting candles, which add to the light that dispels the darkness, with every mitzvah that we do, we are adding to our um, ammunition, so to speak, where we are then able to overcome our, uh, our enemies as well. So it's no coincidence that the miracle was followed by a miracle of light. That the mer It's no coincidence that the mer military victory, that the military miracle of the Jews beating the Greeks eventually was immediately followed by a miracle of light. The two go, go, the two go hand in hand. This also helps explain the difference between the Talmud and the Sidur. Because the Talmud is an ancient text which is discussing ancient occurrences and that's why it's mentioning the miracle of the, of the oil. But if you take a look at the Sidur, what is the Sidur, right? The Siddur is something that transcends time. The Siddur is something where no matter where you are in the, in the span of time, it's always as relevant to your own situation. The same Siddur that we are praying at today in 2018 is the same Siddur that we were praying at 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. And so the authors of the Siddur had to make sure that when we are tapping into the message of Hanukkah, that we are tapping into a message that has resonance, something that is relevant to us. And that's why the Sidur specifically mentions the military victory, because something like that can be brought home on a personal level. The same military victory of weak defeating the, the, the great is, again, the same idea of us having our own battle and realizing that if we keep fighting, our own weak neshama has the power to eventually miraculously overcome 
those forces that seek to keep us away from, from Hashem. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and the Malbim lastly says that once a human being is able to control his own nature, he's also able to control all the rest of nature. But the key is to control our own nature. And so this is the idea, is that we have the ability to change the world ar around us in how we connect to Hanukkah. Now, what I want to do is show you that in the candles, you have three aspects to the candle. And those three aspects really give us an idea also of how we can connect to Hashem. There's the oil, there's the wick, and there's the light, there's the fire. So the oil represents the Jewish people, because if you take a look at the properties of oil, oil will always stay separate from the element that it's in. If you place oil in a cup of water or water in a cup of oil, you'll notice that the oil always stays separate. The, the, um, the, uh, the reason why we, the Jewish people, are compared to oil is because no matter how much we try to be like the nations, we will never be like them, nor do we really want to be like them. We don't, we want to be at peace with them. We want to be at harmony with them, but we recognize that we are different. And that is why, in my personal opinion, there really is no logical or political explanation for why there has been so uh, much uh, anti-Semitism going so many, many years, so many thousands of years. It doesn't really logically make sense. The idea is, is that we were really meant to be alone. We were meant to be separate. It doesn't sound like such an optimistic thought, but ultimately it's, it's what has kept us connected for all these years. The Torah says, is, says it itself. Hein am levadad yishkon uvagoyim lo yitchashav. That this is a nation, this is Bil'am, the sorcerer who is saying this. He meant to curse the Jews. He ended up blessing the Jews. That we are a people that are destined to, to be alone. Hein am levadad yishkon. We will dwell alone and we will not be uh, reconciled amongst, amongst the nations. So again, the oil is the Jewish people. The wick is our connection to God. And the fire is itself Hashem. What, why is fire compared to God? Because, well, when God revealed himself to Moses, it was a fire in the burning bush. Or when God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai, we are told that there was, there was fire, there was thunder, there was lightning. And so the, beauty idea, the beautiful idea is, is that if you take a look at the Hebrew word for the wick, the Hebrew word for wick is petila in Hebrew. Pe, taf, yud, lamid, he. If you rearrange those letters, you get the word tefillah. The word tefillah means prayer. And so a little bit, there's a hint in there that the way for us to connect to God is through prayer. The way we, the oil, connect to that fire with that wick, the Hebrew word for wick is petila. You rearrange the letters of petila, you get the word tefillah is through prayer. So that was one idea that I heard from my wife that I wanted to share with you. But either way, hopefully these ideas give you a little bit of an insight into what we ought to be thinking about on Hanukkah. Sure, we're lighting the candles. Sure, it's beautiful. And it's a beautiful idea of Jewish strength and overcoming adversity, overcoming challenge, courage and bravery. All of those ideas are wonderful. And, and freedom of religion, all of those things are wonderful. But to not forget that there is also a spiritual significance to this day. And, the, and, the, the, um, and that the goal is for us to analyze how we can internalize the messages that, that the Maccabees had in those days and make them applicable to our lives as well. So thank you all for joining us. Don't go anywhere, Chicago people. I'm turning it off the Facebook Live. Thank you all for joining us and have a happy Hanukkah, everybody.